So for this retreat, I've called it taking a breather between incarnations. And it's um, a summary of one of the most important uh, uh, spiritual experiences of my life, which happened on the 30th of January in uh, 2006. And um, it's informed a lot of what I've spoken about, the homilies I've given, the books I've written, you know, lectures I've given over the last 18 years. And so finally at age 77, I decided I wanted to talk more freely and more intensely personally about the uh, at that particular event that happened 18 years ago. So in the course of the retreat, God willing, over the next seven lectures, um, I want to talk firstly about the, um, the history and the methodology of uh, what's called LBL, or Life Between Lives, which was created by uh, a clinical psychologist called Michael Newton. So that'll be the background to it. And then I go on to talk, so I'll give you the framework and the kind of the methodology and the history of this particular form of uh, hypnotherapy. And then I want to talk in much more kind of personal detail about a four hour long session that I did with a very good friend of mine called Matt McKay, who is also a clinical psychologist and has been a good friend of mine and who got, who got trained in what I'm just going to call LBL, Life Between Lives. So... I realized when I decided to do this that this particular retreat was going to be an, inter an intensely personal experience for me. And therefore, I said in the flyer, I need you to cut me some slack. Typically, when I'm speaking, I just create a, a, an outline and then I like to speak extemporaneously uh, from the outline. But because I'm dealing with uh, the transcript of a four hour session that I did with Matt McKay, it, the material is really, really densely packed. And so I've written out the transcript and I'm going to try to deliver it in the way in which it actually happened during the actual session itself. Um, so uh, I actually wrote to Dr. Newton. I'd written, I'd uh, read two of his books, Journey of Souls and Destiny of Souls, and I was really fascinated by them. So I wrote him way back in 2002. Uh, and I got a great letter back from him. And in the letter, he said, he gets several hundred letters every week and his wife goes through them, and she tells him which ones to answer. And she told him she put my letter at the top of the pile for the simple reason that when I write a letter or an email, I always finish by saying, may God continue to hold you tenderly in the hollow of her hand. And the wife thought, you know, talk to this guy. <laughs> so we had a, a lovely correspondence. That was in 2002. So my plan then for, the, for this retreat, God willing, is that... Uh, tonight will be a kind of uh, my, my more typical kind of lecture, and I want to follow. I want to kind of cover the following topics. I want to look at the whole phenomenon of hypnosis and what and hypnotherapy particularly. Then I want to say a little bit about Michael Newton. Then I want to talk about Matt McKay, my friend who uh, conducted the session for me personally. I'm going to explain a little bit more about uh, LBL, Life Between Lives therapy, and then very importantly. I want to talk about what I'm going to call the energy distribution between Atman and Jiva, between this side of the veil and the other side of the veil. Because in order to understand really what life between life therapy is about, you have to understand what is the energy distribution between the incarnated aspect of you and your eternal holographic fractal of source. So the energy exchange between them is vitally important to understanding both this and near-death experiences and also to give you some sense of where your power lies, every single one of you. So I speak about that. Then I'll talk about uh, my theory of the three levels of the self. There are many, many models. You know, like the Hindu model has seven different level bodies. So I just created a, simp a more simple one with three different levels of the self. And then finally tonight, I'll talk a little bit about reincarnation. So tonight's lecture will be my our more typical format. And for the rest of the time, I'm going to be talking from le from lecture two tomorrow, but lecture seven on when on Tuesday night. I want to talk much more about um, looking at the transcript of that session, which was a four hour recorded audio uh, session that I had to transcribe, you know. And I've broken up this into several sections over the course of uh, six lectures. So beginning tomorrow, I'm going to actually get into the the transcript and the material uh, and the experience itself. So tonight, then, I want to look at, um, firstly, the whole notion of hypnosis. 
and hypnotherapy in particular. And um, regressive hypnotherapy, particularly when you use hypnotherapy to age regress somebody, um, it's a very powerful uh, psychotherapeutic modality. So for instance, as a clinical psychologist, if I'm dealing with uh, somebody who has phobias or fears, or even to understand their gifts or their missions, a very powerful way of accessing all that information is in a hypnotherapeutic state. So um, hypnotherapy then consists of three levels of going backwards, if you want to think about it. The first, the most normal one is that you utilize hypnotherapy to access earlier stages of this life. So let's say you're 55 at this stage and you come in to see um, a psychologist and he's using hypnotherapy to uh, access what the issues might be for you. One of the things he may do is to age regress you and say, can you tell me what happened when you were seven years of age? Was there an event that could explain the kind of the phobia you have or the anxiety you're experiencing or the fears of various kinds? So the first level of hypnotherapy then is just regressing your age, regressing you to an earlier stage of this life. But then there was a big jump subsequently using hypnotherapy to age regress you into a past incarnation. So in a previous lifetime, so now you've made a huge jump not just from an earlier stage of this lifetime, but into an earlier incarnation itself. And then the great uh, kind of uh, contribution of Michael Newton, of whom I'll speak now in a few moments, was that he accidentally uh, kind of uh, found himself in a bardo state with a client of his in the hypnotherapeutic session. And so he, he uh, miscalculated the age of a client that he was age regressing. And he put him back into a time before he was actually born. And this person started reporting, reporting particular kind of experiences. And he thought, this is really weird. This doesn't sound like a kind of a, a physical experience at all. And then he discovered that he put them into a, the life between lives, the Bardo state, as it's called in, in Buddhism. So over the course of his life, he did about 7,000 of these and wrote three great books on it. And so for me, this may be the most powerful uh, version of hypnotherapy, not just into a previous a kind of stage of this lifetime, not even into a past lifetime, but into what happens after you die in a previous incarnation and before you reincarnate again. So that life between lives, that for me is the most powerful kind of usage of hypnotherapy. Now, I spent a year in London when I left Africa and I trained in hypnotherapy and then I came to the States and I also trained in it, but I didn't ever do any training in the LBL. I'm actually bringing myself up to speed on it right now, and I'm learning the protocols of it, but I've never conducted an LBL session myself on a client. So to get into a hypnotic state, then the induction is very, very uh, crucial. So the induction is the way in which the hypnotherapist is going to get you into a deeply, deeply relaxed state. And so the technique very often is you begin with full body breathing, and you get the person to really breathe really deeply, and then to imagine particularly that their blood flow coming from their lungs, being driven by the heartbeat, is visiting every single cell in their bodies. And the system I use very often is I will start at the, the soles of the feet of somebody and then have them imagine oxygenated blood reaching the soles of their feet and relaxing any tension there and, create, and uh, healing any illness or tension there. And then I work my way up through their body, right up to the crown of their head and through their shoulders down into their fingertips so that we get um, a deep breathing into every part of the body. And then the second part is deep muscular relaxation. That muscle group by muscle group, I will try to get them to a kind of tense and then relax. Until finally, the entire body is in a muscularly relaxed state and the breathing is really, really deep uh, at a kind of a diaphragmatic level. And then I, you start giving suggestions of various kinds to kind of deepen, deepen the trance. And part of that is uh, to employ visualization. And visualization is not just uh, seeing stuff. So visualization, hypnotherapy, means any engaging all the sensorium, the entire sensorium. You know, you're hearing, you're, you're smelling, you're, you're tasting, you're, you're, you're feeling a, a tactile sensation. And so you try to have them activate every one of the senses in that state. But also to be in contact with their emotional being, and with their intuitive faculties and with psychic powers. So in a hypnotic state then, you're bringing a person into the astral realms or even higher realms still. 
where there's a big difference between imagination and fantasy. So fantasy is the ability to make up stuff that's not real. Imagination is very, very different. Imagination is the ability to volitionally shift my state of consciousness, enter into different dimensions, encounter different energies and different entities in those other dimensions, dialogue with them, learn from them, and then bring it back into this waking state of consciousness. So imagination is hugely different from fantasy. So in a good hypno, uh, hyp hypnotherapeutic trance, then you're trying to get person into their into the visualization and into the imagination. Now, kids are born with this faculty until we send them to school. And I would say it possibly it is the single most important faculty of the human person. It is the most important gift the scientist has. All the great breakthroughs are done not by thinking stuff through, but by imagining possibilities. Like Einstein would sit on a photon of light and travel through space at the speed of light and then look around to see what was happening to him. So imagination is hugely important for, for uh, scientists and for artists, uh, for writers of various kinds, and for little children. That's how they access uh, the higher dimensions. It also it puts us in contact with our ability for time travel. So not only are we experiencing age regression in a particular lifetime, we're experiencing life regression into other times. So we're going back in history and we can also go forward because we have access, uh, I believe, to the Akashic records in which all information is stored. And in, be, in that kind of uh, higher state of consciousness, we see time for what it is. Time is an artifact created by the paucity of our, our little, the laptop that we carry between our ears. When we decide to incarnate, we're subjected to four different limitations. The first one is that we have to trade our cosmic being, we who are cosmic entities, for this tiny little space suit that we call our bodies. That's the first limitation. The second one, we have to trade cosmic consciousness for this tiny little piece of wetware that we carry between our ears. Uh, the, the third part of it is that this little uh, laptop is so small that it cannot grok the entirety of the, the gestalt of our experiences. So we have to break it up into bite-sized pieces and then process them sequentially, giving rise to the illusion of time. And then fourthly, we have amnesia for who we really are, where we've come from, and what our mission is. And so time itself is an artifact of incarnation. It's a limitation of incarnation. So when you get into a different space, a super conscious space, you know, you can see all of time because there is no time does not present itself as a linear movement from a past to a present to a future. Everything is present. So in, um, you can time travel in both directions when you're in that state of consciousness and not just see where you've been, but what lies possibly ahead if you make the correct kinds of choices. So it's creating then altered states of consciousness of various kinds. Um, so in an altered state of consciousness, you have access to your own personal unconscious. Mm -hmm. You know, so the kind of the record of all of the experiences you've had and which have been kind of suppressed or forgotten, you don't have immediate access to them right now because there's not enough space in your brain because memory is not contained in the brain. Memory is simply a transducer and a transmitter and receiver of the cloud, the Akashic record. And so sometimes in an altered state of consciousness, we gain access to our personal unconscious. And then sometimes if we can go deeper, we gain access to the collective unconscious. And this is the function, for instance, of a shaman for a group is to, to, uh, to dream on behalf of the tribe, not just dream on her own behalf, but on behalf of the tribe. And so digging into the collective unconscious means you have access to the data created and the memories created and the life stories created by all the human beings who've ever lived. And then uh, it's, possible to get into what I would describe as a super conscious state, not just a personal unconscious or even a collective unconscious, but as a kind of a superior or a super consciousness, which was a way beyond our normal consciousness. And then we're talking about the Akashic records, because God is a doting grandmother who records everything that all of her children have ever done. So let me say a little bit more than about Michael Newton. He was a clinical psychologist, born in 1931, died in 2016. And um, he was the guy who discovered, invented, or happened upon accidentally this L between ends. He wrote three great books. The first one is called Journey of Souls in 1994. 
The second was called Destiny of Souls, which he wrote in 2000. And then Life Between Lives, which is kind of like a handbook teaching you the protocols mm -hmm. uh, to teach yourself how, how to actually conduct an LBL session. And in his own lifetime, he conducted about 7,000 such LBL uh, sessions. He also founded what's called the Society for Spiritual Regression, uh, and he founded the Michael Newton Institute. So if anybody is interested in uh, uh, experiencing something like this, if you just check up the Michael Newton Institute or the Society for Spiritual Regression, and you're interested in it, you can find people in your area who've been trained. It's a fairly rigorous training to conduct this. So um, the person who conducted this for me is a man called Matt McKay. And Matt has been a good friend of mine for many, many years. An extraordinarily gifted and compassionate man. He was, um, uh, he's a clinical psychologist. He is a professor at the Wright Institute in Berkeley, California. And a way, way back, he founded, he co-founded the Haight-Ashbury Psychological Services for the Homeless in San Francisco and was the director of it for about 25 years. So this is a man who, who walked the talk. He also founded a publishing company, which is still thriving, and now called the New Harbour Joe Press. And he's written probably, I don't know, maybe 25, 30 books. And if you're a psychologist and you're looking for training material, dealing with anxiety or depression or any of these things, uh, Matt's books are right at the top of the list. If you're looking for kind of uh, books, you know, as a psychologist, to kind of train yourself in you know, how to deal with a, a psychotic patient or an anxious patient or a depressed patient, the kind of the textbooks about it have been written by Matt, Matt McKay. And I had the privilege of co-writing a book with him uh, to, in 2013, a book that we called Why What Your Life is Telling You About Who You Are and Why You're Here. Um, so Matt trained then in LBL. Now, on a personal level, Matt had a, an extraordinarily uh, traumatic event happen to him, his family about uh, 10 years ago when his young son, Jordan, was um, uh, killed, murdered in San Francisco uh, by uh, a, a gang who were, uh, the gang was trying to induct a new member and part of the induction ceremony was to create to, to commit a murder. And they just randomly shot this kid coming home from work on his bicycle. His name was Jordan, uh, Jordan McKay. And as you can imagine, uh, Matt was, was devastated. And uh, Matt was so upset that he decided with all his old clinical training, he needed to see a psychic to find out what happened to Jordan. And he had this extraordinary experiences with a psychic who put him in touch. And Matt and his son have written four books now together. His son from the other side, you know, channeling material to Matt. I've just written a review uh, for, for Matt for his latest book, which is just about to come out. And the first of those books was called Seeking Jordan. Jordan was the name of his son. And it's Matt's journey about how he dealt with the murder of his son, you know, and how he established a connection with him and how they have been co-authors of four books over the last uh, maybe 10 years. So that's Matt's story. So let me say a little bit then about the LBL itself, Life Between Lives. Very typically, it's a three to four hour session with somebody who's been trained in it, in which you learn because of the induction is very, very deep induction. Uh, to, to access what I'm going to call a super conscious st uh, state. So the sequence then, if you undergo such a, a session, there'll be an induction and it's a more it's a, a more complete induction than you will normally do. If you're going to see a client just for one hour, you can't afford to spend a whole lot of time in the induction. But if you're doing a four hour session, you can spend a good period of time, up 25 or 30 minutes in the actual induction itself because you're bringing them deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. So you're going way beyond uh, the personal unconscious and the, and the collective unconscious into what I'm going to call the super, the super conscious state. And so the induction is a very, part, a very important part of this process, that you get the client into a really, really, really deep, deep state. And then once in that state, once the induction is completed, typically then during a session, you'll start them off at an earlier stage of this life. And so as you'll hear tomorrow, Matt started me off at the age of 12, asking me, you know, uh, describe your home at age 12. And so we start off with that. And then after a few, a few minutes, he age regresses me back to an earlier stage. He brought me back to age four. And then where are you living now? You know, describe your bedroom. 
that's sort of going backwards in time in this incarnation is shown. And then the next stage was to go back into the womb. You know, you're in the you're in your mother's womb. What does that experience feel like? And then I report to him what I'm experiencing. And then there's this very significant jump from uh, from that into the to your most immediate past life. You make this huge jump from being in utero as shown into my most immediate uh, past lifetime. Um, and then uh, he leads me right up to my death during that previous lifetime. So mm -hmm. uh, right up to the time that I died and, ex and kind of um, re-experience what that process, that process was like for me. And then the, the most interesting part of all is the entry and the exploration of the spirit world. So now you've died. Describe to me now what's happening and what the stage you're going through. And the vast bulk of what I will cover, God willing, over the, the next six lectures is to talk about what that experience was like on the other side after the death in, in a previous incarnation. So in order to understand that, it's a, it's a really complex phenomenon because in some senses, you're dealing with several lifetimes at the same time in the same session. And so I want to kind of explain what the connection is between uh, the body and the soul, between the host and the eternal part. And so um, the integration of the, the soul with the physical brain is a hugely important part of this experience. Because as the soul begins to dock, it's going to have to interface and work through this particular brain. And so understanding what kind of a brain is there to begin with is going to be really crucial in understanding what kind of work the soul is capable of doing. And so um, it, this is one of the most complex kind of uh, mergings in the process. How is the eternal soul going to interface with the, with the physical three pound mass inside in this particular skull of this particular person? What's that interface going to look like? And uh, so that's the, maybe the most complex part of the, uh, the spiritual regression. So is this going to be a kind of a, is going to be a battle or is it going to be a cooperation between the soul self and the brain self or, or, or the ego? And that's what determines the personality that, that emerges in the course of the incarnation. And so I believe actually that the, uh, the personality is simply how the soul interfaces with the environment in which it finds itself. So if you take the same soul and put it into a very different environment, a different personality will emerge because the personality is the temporary interface between the soul, the eternal soul, and the, the, uh, the space of somebody in which it finds itself and the environment, the family environment in which it finds itself. And so um, you're going to interface firstly, you know, with uh, uh, the, the body in utero and then interface with the brain and then you're going to be born into a family. You're going to have to interface with the family and then with the culture and then with the global community. Uh, and so at various stages, the soul yeah. is having to learn uh, these, other, these other stages of the interfacing uh, of incarnation. It's one thing to interface with just a brain. It's another thing to interface with the family. It's another thing to interface with the culture. It's another thing to interface with the, the species, the human species. So at each stage, the soul is trying to learn kind of the ropes of this kind of this merging process. And that leads to interesting kind of situations and difficult situations, as you can imagine. So the therapeutic benefits then of what uh, um, uh, Michael Newton calls spiritual regression as this just hypnotherapy. Um, what are some of the therapeutic benefits? And the first one is that it gives an extraordinary appreciation for the eternal soul self. Most of us are not in contact on a regular basis with our soul selves. We tend to kind of identify with the avatar that the soul has chosen, you know, the ego, which is simply the kind of the avatar that presents itself in this kind of incarnation. And so uh, this kind of the LBL session gives you an extraordinary kind of uh, an appreciation of the eternal soul self and not just the ego. Uh, so we're learning to distinguish in the session between you know, the soul self and the ego and this incarnation only self, which is very different from incarnation to incarnation. It also, the spiritual regression forges an ongoing connection with your spirit guides, because before you came in here, you had guides who prepared you for incarnation, possibly for several different incarnations that they were your guide throughout. 
and they also debriefed you when you went back at the end of an incarnation. And so this LBL gives you an ongoing connection with those spirit guides. It makes it much, much, much more real. Now, uh, having experienced it myself and having a fascination with uh, near-death experience studies, I think there's a huge overlap between the two. And so LBL and NDEs have a lot in common because they help us to significantly refocus our sense of meaning and purpose and mission in this present incarnation. So again and again and again, when you uh, hear a near-death experience uh, stories, everybody will say they came back with a totally different understanding of why they're here, the meaning of life, and what their particular mission is. And often it leads to radical changes, and often it's the ending of relationships because uh, old relationships sometimes kind of sustain the extraordinary change in the personality that the, the NDE or has experienced. And I would say the same thing is true of LBL people, that the experience of LBL, like NDE, it creates a kind of a radical reassessment of the meaning of life and the purpose of your own particular mission. So it's hugely important as a kind of a, a refocusing and a kind of a reorientation of what you want to do with the rest of your life. I want to say something then about the energy distribution uh, between there and here, between uh, Atman and Jiva. In the Hindu model, the soul has two parts, uh, one part of which incarnates on a regular basis. They call that Jiva. And then there's another part of the soul that never incarnates. It's always in the presence of the divine, and they call that Atma. And so they use the example of like two trees, uh, like two birds sitting on top of a tree. Atman and Jiva. And every so often, Jiva swoops down onto the ground and is picking at seeds in the ground. And Atman is just watching. And they're in communication with each other. And uh, Atman uh, is seeing the, literally the bird's eye view. And Jiva is seeing the worm's eye view. And then the, uh, Jiva comes back up and they compare notes. And Jiva says, Here, here's what it feels like down there. Here's what like terra firma feels like. Here's what seeds feel like. Here's what sounds uh, feel like. And Atma says, and here's what I watch you from above. And I could see a much greater environment. And I was a little bit concerned about you because I could see a mountain lion actually not that far away from you. And so they get two totally different perspectives. So in Gaelic, we call this transition point a chyloid, a thin place where the veil between the mystical and the mundane or the kind of the, the sacred and the secular is diaphanous and you can see through it and move through it in various ways. And so that's what happens then, this energy distribution between Atman and Jiva, this movement between the, the two parts. So a hugely important piece of this then is the realization that as you leave the spirit world in order to incarnate again, only you bring only a portion of your soul's energy with you. Only a small part is, is dedicated to it. Now, I would further say that it is possible actually to experience parallel incarnations at the same time. So if I were to spread myself on this, I think there may be more advanced souls in order to kind of speed up their evolutionary development, will do some parallel processing and that they can have uh, simultaneous incarnations at various stages of human history because time doesn't exist. So they became, could be having simultaneous incarnations, one in the 13th century, one in the 25th century, and one in the 21st century in totally different locations. And the kind of the metaphor I use to kind of explain that is, imagine you have a, a favorite um, actor. One of my favorites is Sean Penn. And imagine I were to pre prevail upon the movie theaters in the Bay Area uh, on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock, each of them to show a different movie in which Sean Penn is the, is the main actor. Um, so there's one of them in which he's, um, it's Dead Man Walking. Remember that one? Yeah. Uh, where he's this uh, horrific killer who just murdered two people for the fun of murdering two people. And it's the last day of his life. And then there's another one, it's called I Am Sam, where he's a mentally uh, kind of um, handicapped man raising a very brilliant little seven-year-old daughter. And so now Sam, as Sam, has no idea of this killer in the other movie. But Sean Penn is aware of both characters that he's simultaneously playing. And so that's the relationship between the soul and the incarnate itself. So it's possible that the soul can distribute some of its energy into several parallel incarnations. 
And uh, but you know, uh, if I'm playing two more roles in two different incarnations as Sean, I'm not aware of that because I'm I'm caught with the role of being Sean. I have no idea what other roles my soul may be playing simultaneously in different parts of human history or in different locations. And so it's important then to get it that the soul does not devote uh, the, uh, the even the majority of its energy uh, to incarnation, even if it's a simultaneous incarnations. That there's a large part which always remains at the side of God. So uh, there's there's a part of you called your higher self, or your soul self, or your source self, whatever word you want to use for it, that is always at source and is always plugged in uh, to the divine. So and that means then that you're in the company of your soul pod right now. That there's a part of you which still lives, you know, at the other side of the veil and is in contact with all of the other members of your soul pod, and you're in dialogue with them. And that yeah, your soul self, part of your soul, is there and in dialogue with them. So the ego then is simply, to kind of use modern computer te technology, it's, just, it's basically just an avatar. That this is an avatar necessary in order to play a role as an incarnated being in a three-dimensional, dense world called planet Earth. So you're interfacing then with a portion of the soul cells of your soul pod who are either currently incarnated and are awaiting you as parents or grandparents, as well as part of your soul pod, the energy of your soul pod, that's still back at source. So this interfacing is happening between uh, soul pod members of yours who are currently incarnated and maybe waiting for your arrival. If you're just about to be born, so there are parents waiting for you and possibly grandparents waiting for you, but the soul cells of all the people are in contact with each other. And so there's this extraordinary distribution of energy and communication. And you're being briefed by them and by your spirit guides. So before you incarnate, let's say, just take this lifetime. Before you incarnate in this lifetime, whatever year, whatever date that was, you were briefed just before you arrived. You were briefed by your spirit guides and by all of your soul pod, those incarnated and those not incarnated at the moment, you're totally debriefed on the latest state of the world. Here's the world you're coming to right now. Then you're briefed on the tribe or the culture of which you're going to be a part. Then you're briefed on the family you're coming into. So there are no surprises awaiting the souls coming in. You've been briefed exactly on the state of world politics, on the state of your own tribe, on the state of your own family. And so the soul comes in. Yeah, there are no there are no surprises for the soul. There are huge surprises for the ego as it emerges. Some of them wondering, you know, what the hell did I do coming here? But the soul has no surprises. So you've come in fully prepared. And as you come in, uh, um, you're, you know your own personal uh, track history of all the times you've incarnated before, particularly on planet Earth. You know exactly how you performed. You know what your weaknesses, what your strengths are. And you know the track record, everybody with whom you're going to interface in the course of the incarnation every single person. So you know what you're signing up for. There are no surprises. But having come in, there's amnesia created. And at that stage then, it's improv theater. There's no plot and there's no script. You've been catapulted into a situation. People are gonna act. You're gonna to respond to what they've said. They're gonna to react to what you've just done. And this will be true at the family level, you know, at the village level, at the cultural level, and at the global level. We're all adding pieces to the puzzle. And we're all seeing what the other person is adding, and we're all either adding something else to countermand that or to amplify that in some way. Now, the very final part of the preparation for coming in is some kind of um, a meeting of all these higher levels of, of, of this self. So it may well be that part of this final preparation, you're in dialogue with somebody who may be your spouse in the life into which you're going to incarnate. And it may be that your spouse arrives two or three years after you or comes down two or three years before you. But there's a special kind of uh, connection between people who are going to have a very, very close relationship during lifetime. So um, this final preparation class, then I believe, is about uh, helping us to recognize uh, future soulmates. So this very final preparation before incarnation is to kind of just uh, impress upon us. These are the uh, signals that you receive in during incarnation, that will help you to recognize, oh, no, uh, this is not our first rodeo together. I know that we've been together before. This instant recognition. So you've been prepared for that. 
Also, I think the final preparation session is about uh, the reinforcement of the particular karmic lesson that you want to kind of emphasize in this lifetime that you're about to kind of comment on. And again, I keep saying that uh, karma gets a very bad rap. Karma is not a punitive mechanism whereby I'm being punished in this incarnation for mistakes I made in previous incarnations. That is not karma. Karma is that you've planned a lifetime and you wake up as a newborn baby. As soon as you become rational, maybe at age seven, you realize, oh, wow, I got the exact circumstances I planned before I came in. That's what karma is. Karma is the recognition that life presented you with precisely the circumstances that you planned before you came. It's nothing got to do with uh, bad luck or good luck. And so the reaction to karma should be, wow, I nailed it. I created exactly the situation that my mentors and myself planned before I, I came in. Now, there's a difference then for me between karma, destiny, and fate. Because so karma is that I encounter the exact circumstances I planned before I came. That's karma. Fate is that if I don't play my, my cards according to you know my mission, I deviate from my mission, then my fate is I wind up you know with less accomplishments than I might have. That's fate. If I really play my cards properly and I'm aligned completely with my soul self and I make the decisions for love every time, then my destiny is that. At the end of an incarnation, I've done precisely what I've come down here to do. And then as I plan my next incarnation, there'll be a different kind of a karma. Now, I think as well that as a result of that final preparation, uh, deja vu experiences, I believe, may be a memory of that last preparatory class that we've kind of, uh, we've rehearsed particular encounters we're likely to have. And so when you're in a situation, say, I was here before, and the reason you get that is you were here before. You did a, a dress rehearsal before you came in and you were given this sign so that you'd recognize, okay, this is a special situation or this is a special person. So deja, deja vu or like, it's like Atman poking on the ribs and say, hey, Jiva, wake up. I'm giving you a sign. L look at the sign. Listen to the sign. Now, according to Michael Newton, and this may be kind of... Uh, disputed in some way, it's an interesting uh, situation. He claims that after about 7,000 uh, sessions that um, uh, people report that the uh, the soul joins the developing fetus somewhere between the fourth month and birth. So it's interesting that the Catholic Church claims that you know, the soul comes in at the moment of conception, but the Catholic Church didn't always teach that. In the time of Thomas Aquinas in the 1200s, on the basis of postmortems done on pregnant women, the Catholic Church's position then was that the soul only comes in, to, joins the fetus after 40 days if it's going to be a boy, and after 80 days if it's going to be a girl. And so it shifted it's kind of the, the notion of you know the soul uh, animation happening at the very moment of conception. So that, that could be an interesting discussion sometimes. At what stage does the soul actually uh, join the fetus, which has Implications, obviously, moral implications for the whole topic of uh, abortions. So I want to speak then about uh, I call it the three selves. So if you think typically, how many colors are in the rainbow? And we think seven, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. But the truth is there's an infinite number of gradations on that. These are the ones we can just easily pick out. Now, the same thing is true of any kind of uh, esoteric phenomenon that in, in trying to kind of... Uh, force them into a matrix is to do damage to them. But we have to create kind of a, a roadmaps to help us. So, for instance, in the West, we think that, you know, uh, the body is simply a kind of an amalgam of physiological attributes and biochemical kind of uh, systems, you know, cardiovascular and kind of immune system and, you know, muscular skeletal, that that's what it is. It's just the, the physical body. The Egyptians believe that there are two levels of body. They call them ka and ba. The ka is the physicality and ba is the, the internal kind of uh, soul self. The Greeks had three words for it. The Greeks call, talked about uh, sarx, soma, and pneuma. So sarx is, is just the physical body. And so we get terms in medicine from that, like sarcopenia. So damage to the kind of the physical body. So sarx is the physical body, according to the Greeks. Uh, soma is kind of the, kind of the uh, metaphysical body and uh, pneuma is the spirit body so there are three levels according to the Greek uh, kind of um, uh, cosmology Hinduism claims there are seven different levels of the body 
they call it the uh, the gross body, the physical body, then the etheric body, which is vibrating at a higher frequency than that, then the astral body, uh, then the kind of the uh, mental body, and then the psychic body, then the soul body, and finally uh, uh, source itself. So they break it up into into seven distinct pieces. The truth is, there's an infinite gradation all the way up. And so when I think, for instance, about the notion of heaven or the afterlife, for me, heaven is not a kind of a, a finished state where you cross the finishing line, wow, I made it. And it's the same for every one of us. There's an infinite gradation of what it means to be in heaven, depending on the frequency at which you vibrate, depending on the level of your evolution and the level of your enlightenment. It's an, it's an eternal evolving one. So there's no, there's no cap to it. It's an eternally evolving kind of an enlightenment. That I, the example I use sometimes is like a slider switch on electricity. It's not an on-on, you know, the light is on or off, but it's a slider. The luminosity can be increased. And so heaven is not a place that you arrive at and then you're given a hymn sheet and a harp, you know, and then you sing for the rest of the time. So uh, the same thing would be true for me then. There's an infinite gradation. So uh, what we need to kind of make little roadmap to say, here are three important stages of it. And it's a kind of, a, we're forcing a lot of data into kind of artificial kind of pigeonholes. But the one that, I've, that I created for myself years ago is to think that there are three levels to the self that I experience. The first I call my role self. I'm playing a role as an Irish priest called Sean. You know, and that's my role self. That's what I how I tend to kind of self-identify some other time. But then there's what I call my soul self. So the eternal, you know, uncreated part of me that was never born and will never die, you know, and that I call, that is my soul self that has incarnated many, many times in many, many different planets and many different dimensions. And then finally, there's the source self of which we are holographic fractals. So ultimately, there is only God. And I've said this to you many, many times that uh, the um, life is simply a dream that the ego is having. And the ego is a dream that the soul is having. And the soul is a dream that spirit is having. And spirit is a dream that God, our source, is having. So basically, everything that exists is God in drag. There is only God. And so all of the other divisions are simply to, to volunteer to generate experiences for God. Because if God is all, is all there is, then God cannot have experiences. If there's nothing apart from God, there's no way that God can experience anything. So we are kind of uh, volunteers, holographic fractals. Uh, in the Hebrew has a great phrase for this. It's called netzotzim, sparks of the divine. That the divine shatters itself into a myriad of, of pieces called souls in order to generate experiences for source. In the same way that a colony of bees leaves the hive in order to gather pollen you know, and nectar and stories and bring it back to the hive. So God is the hive mind, you know, and we're the bees who go out to create the experiences for source. And so for me, there are these three levels, the role self, the soul self, and the source self. And whenever I hear Jesus speaking of a parable, and he's done it many, many times, where it's a parable about a rich man and a worker, or a kind of a, a king and a steward. And we think this is a kind of a sociological parable. It's not. It's this, this, this steward or the servant or the slave Basically, the master or the king is always the difference between the soul self and the ego or between source and, and incarnation. It's the push and pull that happens between when I identify with my ego and I think I'm in charge instead of identifying with my soul and realizing I'm a bite-sized piece of God. So all of the parables he tells with had this have these sociological distinctions, they're to show actually a psycho-spiritual distinction between your source self you know, on the one hand, and your ego on the other hand. And finally, let me say something about reincarnation before we finish. The vast bulk of human cultures have believed in and taught reincarnation. It makes perfect sense. It's only very, very laterally that the kind of materialistic scientism has be had believed that only matter exists you know, and when we die, matter dissolves. We redistribute ourselves to get the uh, the worms eat us up, or uh, the birds come and pick our eyes out, or whatever. So reincarnation is an ancient, ancient, ancient system, and you find it in all the great cultures of the world. It's part of my Celtic tradition. It's part of the biblical tradition. It's part of the African tradition that I I spent fourteen years in, and very obviously, it's part of uh, Buddhism and Hinduism. The Scandinavian mythologies are full of it. 
uh, Inuit mythologies are full of it. Native American Indian uh, kind of cultures are full of it. So reincarnation has been a kind of the, the given wisdom of all our forebears up until very, very recently. And there's certainly biblical evidence for it, including in the teaching of Jesus himself. And my two favorite examples are Matthew chapter 17 and John chapter 9. So in Matthew chapter 17, it's a week before Jesus dies. And he takes three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, and they go up into Mount Tabor. And he has what's called the transfiguration experience, in which Moses and Elijah appear uh, to them. And it's so real that the disciples can see it as well. Now, Moses is dead 1,250 years, and, I, and uh, um, Elijah is dead um, almost 800 years. And one of them represents the prophets, and one represents the law, because the Jewish scriptures are divided by the priests into two groups, the law and the prophets. Now, the Sadducees believed in a third level called the writings, a kind of existential writings. But the priests at the time only believed in the law and the prophets. So here's Jesus having, in some senses, an encounter with the entire history of his own people. And um, as they're coming down the mountain, the apostles ask him a very interesting question. They say to Jesus, why do the scriptures say that before the Messiah arrives, Elijah has to come back? And Jesus says, Elijah already came back. And they didn't recognize him. And then in Matthew's gospel, he adds in parenthesis, here Jesus was talking about John the Baptist. So according to Jesus' teaching, John the Baptist was the reincarnated um, Elijah. Now, I have a, a theory about that, a kind of a funny theory in, in a way. If you go back into the story of Elijah in the, the books of Kings, First and Second Kings, Elijah wasn't a very, very nice character. Elijah was a devotee of a particular god called Yahweh. And at the time, the king of Israel, a kind of his, his name was Ahab, he married a Philistine princess called Jezebel, and she brought in her own gods and was worshipping her own god. And so Elijah was really upset about this. And the people of Israel began to follow Jezebel's gods because Yahweh turned out to be a really good war god, but he turned out to be really, really poor at agriculture and rainmaking. So the crops were failing. So they figured out, you know, he got us out of Egypt, but since then it's been just one famine after the other. So maybe we need to change change our alliances. So they start following uh, the gods of Jezebel. And Elijah gets really, really upset. So he, he challenges them to a contest offering on the top of Mount Carmel. And uh, there he builds an altar and they build an altar. And they slaughter the bull and he slaughters the bull and they put them on their altars. And Elijah says to them, you know, you pray to your God and tell your God to bring down fire and set fire to the, to the Holocaust. And they're dancing and jumping and they're singing and, and they're piercing themselves with arrows to draw their own blood and nothing happens. And Elijah says, get out of my way. And then he says, I know your God, you know your God, zap it. All of a sudden, the whole thing goes up on fire. And Elijah's immediate response is, grab them. And they grab the 450 prophets of Baal and they take them down to the river Jabbok and they cut their heads off. And then Jezebel finds out, which is, may my God do such and such to me if by this time tomorrow, I don't have your head. So Elijah disappears and he's complaining to God, they hate me, everyone. They're all running against me and I didn't do nothing. So he has to disappear. <laughs> now, I believe that 800 years later, they all came back. They reincarnated. So... Achab uh, reincarnates as King Herod, and Jezebel reincarnates as his wife, Herodias, you know, and um, uh, John the Baptist is the reincarnation of Elijah. And what happens to John the Baptist? He gets his head cut off. So um, <laughs> Herodias, it was, her, it was Herod's birthday, and there's a big, big party, and he invites his wife's uh, daughter to dance for him. And she danced so seductively, he says to her, I'll give you anything you want, even half my kingdom. Tell me what you want. So the girl goes to her mother and says, what did I ask for? And the mother says, the head of John the Baptist on a platter. And so that's what they do. They go in and they behead John the Baptist. And so my belief system is this was reincarnation. And John, yeah, John the Baptist was getting his due because as Elijah, he'd cut the heads off 450 other people. But it's interesting, so that Jesus is now saying uh, John the Baptist is Elijah reincarnated, and I believe he was. So that's the first story you find in the New Testament about reincarnation. Then there's a story in John chapter 9, where Jesus is coming out of the city of Jericho, 
and they see a man, a beggar man, who's been born blind, and he's sitting at the gates begging. And the disciples said to Jesus, whose fault was it that he was born blind? Was it his own sin, or was it his parents' sin? Now, that question doesn't make any sense unless you believe in reincarnation. How can somebody be born blind because of their own sin, unless they screwed up in a previous incarnation? So in actual fact, when you dig into esoteric Judaism, there's a big belief in reincarnation. Now, my own personal experiences around reincarnation, um, I lived among the Kalenjin peoples of East Africa, three different tribes of people for 14 years. And they had a very interesting version of reincarnation, so when a baby was born in, in, in the Kalenjin, for the Kalenjin people, it was given three different names. So the first name had to do with the circumstances of the birth. So if I met a little girl, I said to her, what is your name? And she says to me, my name is, my name is Chimgeno. I knew that she was born when the goats were going out to the, to, to the lake, the salt lake. Uh, if I asked her, uh, a little boy, what is your name? And he said, it means I knew he was born during a famine time. If I find somebody's name was Kipchurchir, I knew that there was real problems around the birthing, that there was, you know, it was, it was a problematic whether the child was going to survive or not. So the first name had to do with the immediate circumstances of the child's birth. The second name given was called Kainetab Musarek, which meant the porridge name. And this was a special pet name that only the mother could use of the child. Nobody else was allowed to use that name for the child. But then the, uh, the third name was very interesting. They would bring in an elder of the tribe who knew the entire ancestry of the baby, and the elder would start naming out the ancestors in chronological order. And when the, when the child sneezed, they said, ah, that's the one who's come back. So the way the spirit indicated that it was reincarnating in this little baby was to make the baby sneeze. So the baby would sneeze, and that was the, the name they got. Now, if after a month or so, the child proved to be very kind of colicky and upsetting and crying nonstop, they would believe that they got the wrong ancestor. And so they'd do the ceremony again until the child sneezed again. And the second time, and I saw this, it always worked. If you had mistakenly identified the ancestor that came back, and then you redid it a month later, the child was not being fussy. And so I came across that among the Kalenjin people. Um, and then when I came to the States, I had my first really powerful um, reincarnational experience. I was attending a weekend workshop, a three-day workshop, with a lady called Barbara Finn Dyson, and it was called uh, Perinatal Exercises, where uh, you recreate a birth canal of pillows, literally of pillows. And you're in a room with a, a, a sitter, somebody who's taking a kind of charge of you, and there's special kind of music and the room's complete darkness. And you're meant to experience your own birth process because there's a, a big correlation between difficulties experienced during the birthing process and subsequent uh, neurosis in adult life. Um, there's a, a, a system called uh, the perinatal matrices where during the four critical stages of the birthing process, if there's a difficulty experienced by the child, there will be subsequent kind of neurotic behavior evidenced in the adult. And the four great critical periods of the birthing process, the first one is, you know, the, uh, the beginning of the contractions, where the child has been somersaulting and is really free in the womb, all of a sudden the walls are closing in around the child. Um, and so that's the first great crisis. The second great crisis is now being reoriented to engage its head in the birth canal, but the cervix is still closed, so there's no way out. It's been forced here to, to against the shut door. And then the cervix begins to open, there's dilation happening, and then it's squeezing through the birth canal. And this is really, really different. That's the third one. And then the fourth one is the child is born, all these bright lights, all these rope noises, and then they cut the umbilical cord. So there's a belief system that depending on which stage proved most traumatic in the birthing process, will be uh, there'll be corresponding difficulties in the adult and you are result, resulting itself in some kind of neurotic behavior of some kind. So we come to the situation and there are 23 of us in the class and every single person has an experience of their own birth. And I'm thinking when it comes to me, I'm gonna experience what it was like to be in my mother's womb and being born. And what happened instead was that I had an experience of being a young Tibetan girl giving birth to our own firstborn child. And it went on for about four hours and it was so real that for literally for 
And nearly a week later, a week later, I had pains in my thighs from having given birth to this. So that was my own person, my first experience of a reincarnation. And it made a huge, huge impression on me. I've subsequently kind of recovered about seven or eight other snippets from other incarnations, but that was kind of the most, the most profound. I, uh, so I'm going to find out, finish then by just talking briefly about what I call the preconception contract. That before we come in, then before the soul incarnates, we make a preconception contract in which we know the track history of ourselves and all of the important players. We also know our mission. And it feels to me that the very last thing that grandmother God whispers as you kind of head off for incarnation is your own secret, sacred name. There's a special name you're given, you know, and it is your essence. And it's not the name that they gave you when they poured water over your head and baptized you. There's a secret, sacred name that literally reverberates and resonates and vibrates at the frequency of your soul and particularly of your mission. And so um, we, we, we come in, we have the preconception contract, and then it's improv theater. And I finish up by saying I had, um, I had a client one time in my psychology practice who was a, a professional actor, and he, his specialty was improv theater, where he'd go on stage, even with one other actor, and uh, they'd ask the audience, throw us a word. And so somebody says, bananas. Okay, so you hear the word bananas, now you have to make up a play about bananas. So one person is going to say something about a banana, the other guy is going to have to respond to it. But he said there are two basic rules of improv theater. The first rule is you have to have to work with whatever line your, your partner gave you. You can't say, that's a dumb thing to say. Show me a different line. I can't work with that one. You have to work with every line your partner is giving you. And secondly, your job is to make the other person look good. By feeding them lines, you know they can really, really work with. And I thought... What a great metaphor for life itself, that you have to harvest the life you find yourself in, and that your job is to make other people in your life look good. Namaste, brothers and sisters. Maybe 15, 20 minutes. Oh, question. The question was, if there are infinite gradations, how do we eventually merge with source itself? Susie is asking that question. And so I think there, there comes a stage when... Uh, a person is so in tune with source itself that there's no distinction possible between them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, how many lifetimes that takes or how many kind of versions into the afterlife that it takes. But I, I really do believe that that's the end point and that God folds up the game at that stage. Uh, this game of, uh, of Lila, Hinduism calls it Lila, this particular game. And so every incarnation is an opportunity to kind of raise the vibration or the frequency or kind of the, uh, the luminosity of, of the enlightenment. And so as we move backwards and forwards between incarnations, and I think we do it in different levels of incarnation, and not just on planets like planet Earth, which are 3D dense ones, although that this is really, really difficult, that there are other levels, the angelic realms, that we move through different uh, degrees of kind of acknowledgement and alignment with source itself. Until finally, you know, there's nothing, there's no need to have us separated from source at all. And then we merge as individuals, we merge. Now I use this example, like for instance, you think of the human body. Mm -hmm. So the human body has about 70 trillion cells in it. And every single cell is completely independent. Every cell has a cardiovascular system, an immune system, an elimination system. So it's totally, you know, self-sufficient. But at some stage, you know, a bunch of cells get together and they form organs. And so now a bunch we're gonna, will specialize as heart cells or will specialize as kidney cells or whatever. But the cells themselves within the organ are still independent. But now they're operating as a team to create a, a kidney or a, a heart. And then at some stage, a group of organs get together and they create an organism. So we've got a human being with all these subcomponents, these organs in it. Now you take the human being then and it's a member of a family system. And the family is a member of a tribe and a tribe is a member of a culture and a culture is a member of a nation and a nation is a member of Homo sapiens sapiens and Homo sapiens sapiens is part of all sentient lives in this cosmos. And so at each stage up, the, the family gets bigger and bigger. The individuals still retain their kind of their freedom as individuals but they also uh, agree to be subsumed into a higher level of functionality. So there's something the organ can do that the individual cell can't do. 
Uh, there's something that the kind of the organism can do that the individual organ cannot do. There's something that the family system can do that the individual can't do. But we're not seeding our individuality. So you don't brutalize a member of a family in order to make them a member of a family. And so all the ways up, you know, we are learning to be members of a bigger and a bigger and bigger team. Until finally, the final stage is uh, we've merged completely with God. We've been subsumed completely. Every level of individuality has been subsumed into the into the, the Godhead. And at that stage, the individual spark of you know the net so team, the kind of the separated soul, you know, which is the first illusion on the way out from source and the last illusion on the way back to source, it just uh, it dissolves into the uh, into the ocean of God's love. The question is, uh, as a psychologist, how do I work with the uh, uh, schizophrenia? I've had schizophrenic uh, uh, clients in my in my practice, so it's interesting to me that there's there's a spiritual adage that says the schizophrenic drowns in the same waters in which the mystic swims. So I believe that a schizophrenic is having real experiences. You know, when you think oh, they're done making it up, it's all in their head, the voices or whatever. Everything that can be experienced is real. Everything, you know, you see, every sensory experience you have is real. Every memory you have is real in some senses. So anything that the, that exides in the phenomenological realms is real. It can be experienced. So a schizophrenic for me is having a real experience. The problem is they don't know what context in which to uh, use it. So let's say, for instance, let's say I speak French and, and, and English. And I go to France and I insist on speaking English in France. And nobody understands me. And then I come back to uh, uh, England and I start speaking French and nobody understands me. So, you know, I'm using the wrong language in the wrong place. <laughs> now, the mystic is somebody who speaks French and English, but will only speak English in England and only speak French in France so they can be understood. The schizophrenic comes back and is speaking French in England and speaking English in France. So it's not like they're not having real experiences, but they don't know how to kind of uh, uh, contour it to the environment in which they find themselves. So the experiences then are completely out of kilter with the normality around them. So they appear to be crazy people, but they're actually having really important experiences. The question is, can they be kind of uh, taught how to speak English in England and how to speak French in France? And that's the trick in working with a schizophrenic, not to kind of deny and claim that they're crazy having these weird experiences, they're real experiences. Or suppress them with drugs, exactly, which is the typical thing suppress no drugs and drive them deeper and deeper into the, the schism between being able to speak English in England and French in France. Yeah. So Johan is asking two questions. The first one is, how did the medieval Christianity come up with the notion that boys come in at, at 40 days and, women, and girls come in at 80 days? And then secondly, she has the experience that souls come in and out. So I'll answer both of those questions. The, the basis for the Catholic belief that um, soul comes in after 40 days for a boy and 80 days for a girl is based on post-mortems on pregnant women. That was the kind of the conclusion they came to, uh, looking at kind of what the fetuses look like, you know, in, in, the, in the eviscerated uh, dead mother. They came to this conclusion that medical science would then say that, you know, we can recognize a boy after 40 days and a girl after 80 days. So that's the kind of thinking that led to this understanding. The other part of your question then about, you know, souls that come in and out. So I think it is possible, you know, that uh, souls can come in at any stage of the process. You know, there are some systems that claim it comes in at a conception. Some that say it comes in when the mother feels the first movement in her womb. Some claim that it only comes in when the first breath is taken after the child has been delivered. So there's a whole range of when does the soul join with it. Uh, and even an idea that SIDS, sudden infant death syndrome, is that the young, the young baby, you know, after three or four months says, that's it, I'm out of here, I don't want any more of this. So there's a whole range of uh, belief systems about how and when the soul merges, you know, with the, with the developing fetus, you know, uh, embryo and then and child being born. So uh, I think it is possible that the, um, the soul still has freedom. And so it's interesting I have a sign of the cross that I now make every morning, instead of saying in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen, what I say, you know, um, I thank you for vo volunteering for incarnation, for being conceived, for being born, and for being ordained. So that for me is kind of my mission that I start my day with right now. Mm -hmm. Volunteering for to coming, being conceived, being born, you know, and being ordained. In my case, being ordained as a Catholic priest. And so in some senses, I could, you know, the soul could change its mind at any stage, you know, 
um, and uh, take an exit. Um, now, there's a difference between the soul making a decision and the ego making a decision. So, for instance, I believe that part of the preconception contract is that the soul identifies three or four possible exit strategies uh, for the for ending an incarnation. And as we get to a particular, the first one, the soul may say, no, you, you, you haven't quite got there yet. There's a few more things you need to do. Let's keep going. And you meet the second kind of exit ramp. And the soul says, you know what? You still didn't get what you're meant to be doing. Let's keep going. And at some stage, the soul says, you know what? It seems we're wasting our time here. You know, <laughs> let's call it quits. You know, we do a, we a debrief you and bring you back down here later. And so I think there's an ongoing dialogue between the soul and the kind of the space suit as to when to formally commit to the incarnation process. Mm -hmm. And I think it can be anywhere from conception, you know, uh, to birth. Yeah. But after birth, any decision to prematurely end a life is a decision made only by the by the ego. Any decision to end an incarnation after birth, you know, I believe is a decision made by the ego, either the ego of the person, you know, who's killing me or me committing suicide. Waven Dean is asking the question about what is the point of knowing about past incarnations? Because he's saying everybody claims they were near uh, Napoleon or Cleopatra. Now it's interesting, this this kind of um uh, claiming that everybody claimed to be a Cleopatra or Napoleon, uh, the literature does not support that at all. You know, 99.999% of people who've had past life experiences, real life past experiences, claim to be very ordinary people, very ordinary people. So that's a way, in some sense, of kind of dismissing it and saying there's no point in paying attention to this because it's only very, very rarely that somebody with kind of the notions of grandiosity want to claim to have been somebody important in a previous lifetime. Although when you think about it, you know, if, people, if there were important people in the past and they need to reincarnate, they're going to have to find some poor fool. They're going to host them next time around. So obviously, important people in the past do need to come back at some stage, but they're a tiny, tiny minority. But the more important question you're asking, Reverend Dean, is what is the purpose and what is the value of knowing past lifetimes? Because it gives you a kind of um, um, a, meta, a meta cosmic trajectory. It allows you to see a much longer timeline. So, for instance, uh, if I were to draw a graph on a blackboard and then I were to cover up, you know, nine tenths of it and just show you a middle section and ask you, where do you think that graph began and where do you think it's headed? You know, on the basis of what's presented to you, you could be totally wrong. It may appear as a sine wave in the piece I've kind of shown you, or it could be, you know, ascending at an angle of 45, or it could be going asymptotic. You have no idea from that just slice. If I take away the part I've covered up, then you've got a much better idea of what the trajectory of, of the uh, uh, the graph was. So when you get a kind of a much greater timeline, you've got a much better idea of what your soul has been committed to, what it's learned, what it still needs to learn, and why this incarnation might allow you to go a bit nearer to it. So you've got a much, much bigger, you've got a much, much bigger sample uh, to deal with. And therefore you can uh, determine much more easily, you know, what you've succeeded in doing in the past and you don't need to focus on any more and stuff that you didn't quite get and need to focus on maybe in this lifetime. Mm -hmm. So John's question is about, you know, to say more about parallel parallel lifetimes and the notion of history. I'm living in an actual time right now, so how can I process the notion of parallel lifetimes? The truth is with this kind of, this fixated little three pound mass I carry between my ears, it's very difficult to do it. So I think we need to be in altered states of consciousness. And I think we it happens to us regularly in our dream states. How often do you have dreams in which characters appear that you've never actually met? Or you find yourself living in a house and you say to yourself, I knew it was my home, but it didn't look anything like the house I actually grew up in. But there's a sense of it was my home. And so a part of you knows that you've been there before, but you know, and you know it's your home, but it doesn't look anything like the house that you actually grew up in. And then there's characters in your dream, you wonder, who the hell, how did they put in an appearance? I don't know these people. And I find myself in circumstances that I've never actually been in, in this incarnation as shown. But in my dream state, you know, I'm having dialogues and I'm having experiences. And so I call that kind of leakage between parallel lifetimes. And that the human, the human brain is using the off time when I'm not concerned with just kind of daily traffic. It's using the off time to do some kind of parallel processing and to leach information and learning from several lifetimes, you know. So I'm learning from all of them at the same time. And that dreams and visions 
the altered states of consciousness are ways in which the kind of the uh, the parallel lifetimes are intersecting with each other. And because I'm outside of time right now, at that stage, time doesn't exist. And so it's like, if I were to show you a movie, John, two hour movie, and now you're watching this scene, and five minutes later you're watching another scene, and then half an hour you're watching a third scene. Now you're gonna to have to take two hours to process what's on that reel, but it's all contained on the reel before you ever started. You take, you know, War and Peace, 600 pages of a tome. That's going to take you a month to read through it. But as soon as you took the book in your hand, everything you're going to actually read and process is contained already there. So it's only a question of how quickly can you download it? Now, if I have to download it by reading it, it's going to take me a month. If I order it on Amazon, I can download it in 10 seconds. And so Amazon can download the whole thing. In 10 seconds, that's going to take me a month to download by, by reading it. And so the, the processing power is radically different in all the states of consciousness because we're outside of time. Time does not exist in that. Now, to translate it, you know, in waking consciousness, I know how to, to force the template of a linear timeline on it. But when you look at any of the great uh, indigenous cultures, they did not believe in linear time. They believed in secular, uh, cyclical time. You know, that there are great eras, like the Mahayugas in, in, in Buddhism, or like the Mayan uh, culture, that we uh, history repeats in cycles. And so the notion of linearity of time is a peculiarly kind of Western notion. Uh, and it really doesn't hold up to the data, particularly the data generated in altered states of consciousness. John's comment was uh, about the schizophrenia. And he used as an example, you know, William Blake, this extraordinary, brilliant uh, uh, English mystic who was accused of being crazy during his own time. And even by very other, some other very famous uh, poets of the time, like uh, uh, Shakespeare, was it Wordsworth, you said? Uh, Wordsworth, yeah. Wordsworth, yeah. And so this notion, yeah, Hinduism is very strong in this notion of the, um, uh, the, the crazy mystic. And that uh, to the rest of us, the mystic looks crazy because they live in a very not just state of consciousness, but in fact that they're in touch with a higher level and a deeper meaning of consciousness. And we're plodding along, you know, in, in our sensible brown shoes in this kind of uh, earth-based tree density and think that anybody who's not with us is, you know, crazy. So again and again and again throughout, throughout history, you get this kind of, this belief system that uh, uh, the, the idea that somebody who's not part of the tribe and acting in a rational fashion according to the kind of the, uh, the the consensual reality must be must be crazy this is very yeah shamanism very strong yeah absolutely the shaman in, in the shamanistic tradition is, is is the crazy yeah yeah so Stefan is talking about different teachers Ramana Maharshi um who is the second one you mentioned? And and so about the kind of the core essence, the unborn self. So that's, you know, you find that again throughout all the great traditions. Uh, the Buddha himself talked about an atma, which means no soul. And Confucius had the belief system that uh, the, uh, the self is simply an illusion created by the sum of our social roles. So for, for Confucius, there are five vitally important roles that everybody plays. There's the relationship between um, husband and wife, between parents and children, between elder brother and younger siblings, between teacher and student, and between the emperor and the subjects. And Confucius says, as you play in these five roles, there's a sense of self created, which actually is an illusion. So the illusion is created by the sense of, you know, by the, our social roles. And the example I've used to explain this is, if we were watching, let's say there was a spider's web up in the ceiling, in the corner of the ceiling. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at concentric polygons, which are attached to the walls in the ceilings with strings. And I said to you, can you show me the center of that spider's web? And you point to the kind of the inner polygon into the center of it. You said, that's the center. And then I strip off the polygons and I strip off this, the attachments and say, where's the center of the spider's web now? And you said, there isn't a center because the center was an illusion created by the concentric polygons. And so this was the Confucius teaching that our sense of separate self is an illusion created by the sum of our social roles. And for the Buddha, Anatman, our no soul was kind of the illusion that we're separate. So that's exactly what you've been saying, Stefan, mm -hmm. that the ultimate, the ultimate enlightenment is the realization, as I've said before, that the soul is the first illusion on the way out from God and the last illusion on the way back into God. Here's okay. a question by Elizabeth in the chat. And she says, 
I missed the name of the birthing process difficulties that can create life neuroses. They're called the basic perinatal matrices. And it's a guy called Stan Groff, um, a psychiatrist, a brilliant psychiatrist, you know, who talked about this, called basic perinatal, perinatal meaning around the birthing time, basic perinatal matrices. The just question is, in, in the evolutionary trajectory into more and more enlightenment, is it possible, you know, during an incarnation to actually go backwards a little bit? So is it always an upward graph or are there kind of sometimes kind of valleys in the graph? Um, during any incarnation, I believe, Joe, there are two things pertinent to your question. The first one is that I think there are some souls who overreach even against the advice of their mentors. The heavenly mentors will never dictate uh, the lifetime or the body or the culture or the circumstances. They'll advise the soul, you know, as to what's appropriate for them. But there'll be some souls who are figuring out, I can do it, you know, uh, sign me up. And that they volunteer for an incarnation, which is really above above their pay grade, you know, and they're now they're not able to uh, kind of fulfill their mission. And they actually slip backwards because they fall into kind of, uh, it, either into crime or kind of just uh, kind of uh, self-loathing or depression, whatever it is. And that temporarily for an incarnation that they slide backwards. And that the next time that when that lifetime ends and they're uh, in the kind of the healing spa, which is part of the post incarnational uh, kind of uh, process, that they review what they've done and they realize, you know, it was somehow it was my pride that got in the way. I bit off more than I could chew. And I realized that rather than uh, not only did I not fulfill what I wanted to do, you know, I slipped back from where I was previously. So, you know, there's the possibility at every level. At every stage of evolution, we have more and more abilities and we have greater and greater temptations, including the temptation to kind of uh, some kind of self-glorification. And so we have to be really, really careful. Every incarnation is a kind of, uh, it's a roll of the dice. Bill Lyons' question is, um, and in the times when we actually backslide during an incarnation, aren't we still learning stuff? And he's absolutely right. And you hear this all, very, very often in sports, in sports metaphors that, you know, a defeat, you can learn more from a, de from a defeat than you can from a victory. And so that's absolutely true. There is no situation that cannot be harvested for good. Yeah. And so I, 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 I'm reminded of one of the famous parables of Jesus, who was the master of paradox, you know, and ending with a line that gives everybody scratching their heads. He tells the story about um, a very rich man who was a steward, whom he put in charge of all his property. You know, and this guy is working for him for years and years. And then he finds out that the steward has been embezzling his property. So he calls him to an accounting. He says, I found out you've been embezzling. So I need to see the books. And so the guy thinks, holy God, what am I going to do now? I'm too old to get a real job. I'm too ashamed to beg. I know what I do. And he calls in his master's debtors. And he says, Bill, how much do you owe my master? And Bill says, you know, 10 barrels of, of wine. And I give, he gives him his bill. He says, here, Bill, change it to, to six. And Bill changes it to six. And he says, Sharon, how much do you owe my master? You know, 100 bushels of wheat. Here's your bill. Change it to 50. And then Jesus said a very strange thing. He said, the master praised the unjust steward insofar as he had acted wisely because the children of this generation are wiser to their kind than the children of light. Now, was he praising this guy's duplicity? Absolutely not. What he was saying was, here was a guy, the steward, who could turn every situation to his own economic advantage. When he was employed, he was, you know, creaming it off and bezzling. But even when he got fired, he was going to say, back shishi, you know, I need, you know, I cut your bill in half. I need to see a little bit of the green stuff here. And so he could turn every situation to his own economic advantage. And Christ is saying, why can't you learn to turn every situation to your own spiritual advantage? So you're absolutely right, Bill. There is no situation from which we cannot learn. Now, it may feel like, you know, a retrograde step, and indeed it is a retrograde step in the sense that, you know, I'm less illumined than I was. But if I've woken up to the fact that I'm in the dark, you know, maybe at that stage, that's the lesson I needed to learn in order to make even more significant mm -hmm. progress in the next incarnation. Do you all hear that question? If you're <laughs> living parallel lives, are these lives influencing each other and learning from each other? So I'll give you an example, Karen. Uh, you're a mother. You're a wife, you're a grandmother, you're for, uh, until, you know, you were president of COJ for many, many years. You're involved in a whole bunch of other stuff. You look after Pathios for us, you look after the liturgies for us. Are any of these cross-fertilizing? Oh, oh. 
<laughs> yes. Okay. So every one of these things that Karen has been doing, you know, most of our life are influencing the other areas of our life. So her, you know, her work as a mother is influencing her work as a grandmother. Her work as a school teacher was influencing, you know, the work that she did as a COJ president. So they're all interfacing with each other constantly. So we don't often think of it like that, but every every job we do and every kind of function we perform in lifetime is feeding into other functions and other jobs we're doing even within a lifetime. And so the same thing would be true about parallel lives. They're all interfacing and all, all learning from each other. And so anytime, anytime that you're particularly in an altered state of consciousness or in a dream state where you're actually having access to the characters in those other places, that just like you're speeding up the process, but even if you don't have, you know, conscious access to the other parallel lifetimes, they're feeding each other as much as the mother in you is feeding, the grandmother in you is feeding, mm -hmm. the president in you. Mm -hmm. 